Watch this. It won't exactly be a tea party, but we could see a petrol party if our next door neighbor to the north decides to throw an extra gas tax on us to help pay for their infrastructure upgrades. Idaho's political leaders make their protests known. 85 days out from the Idaho primary election, but you could have just about two weeks to declare a political affiliation if you plan to vote. A potential new law could change the way primaries look in Idaho. It all started with Washington. Now we have a three-day weekend to honor him. So what about the rest of the presidents? Well, it could be their day too, I guess. In fact, every day is President's Day inside here. Taxes are always a touchy topic at the Idaho State House, especially when those taxes are the topic at another state house and might actually touch Idahoans. The state of Washington is considering adding an additional tax to fuel they send out of state, like to places like Idaho and Oregon. And you may be thinking, good move, Washington. You know, they have, or here in Idaho, we have zero oil refineries in the state, and we depend on places like Washington for the gas to fill our tanks. But many others might be seeing this as more of taking advantage of a situation. Joe Paris spoke with Governor Brad Little and other state house leaders about the situation they find themselves in and what actions they're prepared to take. There's growing frustration at the Idaho State House over a piece of legislation. Nothing new on that front. But this time, the legislation isn't from Idaho. It's from the state of Washington's legislature. A transportation and infrastructure package there includes a new six cent tax on fuel sent out of Washington to places like Idaho, Oregon, and Alaska. Well, they had a little incident in Boston Harbor over tea about this uh, about 250 years ago. Idaho Governor Brad Little and other state leaders say the concepts from the Washington legislature would essentially mean states like Idaho would be paying the bill for Washington's infrastructure package. Little and the Idaho Attorney General say they have legal concerns. I don't think it's constitutional. I don't think, I mean, the whole concept of, of our system is that you can't tax some other state, it's a violation of Commerce Clause. There's all kinds of things. Uh, the easiest thing is they just not do it. Governor Little and Attorney General Lawrence Wasden sent this letter to Washington Governor Jay Inslee asking him to stop the added fuel tax on Idahoans. The letter asks Inslee to consider how the 6% tax would impact Idahoans already struggling with inflation and rising fuel costs. They write, quote, if these proposals reach your desk, we ask you to veto them. Now is not the time for our states to turn on each other with excise tax proposals that dampen our economy and increase costs for everyone. States can't treat states this way, and for good reason. We have the, the Commerce Clause in, the, in our Constitution. House Speaker Republican Scott Bedke and members of the Idaho House are also pushing back on the legislation. They drafted this House Joint Memorial, which is essentially a message to Washington lawmakers, asking them to consider the great relationships in business and commerce between Idaho and Washington as they consider a fuel tax on Idahoans. I understand the principle. You know, if you have a neighbor uh, in a position where you can extort money, yeah, maybe. But uh, neighbors don't do neighbors that way. We're, we're alarmed. Uh, we don't think that friends and neighboring states should do each other this way, and, we'll, uh, and we're looking at all of our options. One of those options is to take this issue to a court of law. That can only happen if the legislation passes in Washington and Governor Inslee there signs it. If that does happen, Governor Little is confident that a court would side with Idaho. I think they got bad legal advice. I think that's part of it. I think they, uh, somebody told them they could do this and, you know, it's, it's early and we don't have any damages because they haven't implemented yet. But as soon as they do, uh, we'll, we'll file suit. But uh, we'll, if I need to, I'll call Governor Inslee. Little adds that the Commerce Clause in the United States Constitution was specifically written for moments like these. The reason the Articles of Confederation failed and we wrote the Constitution was because the 13 states were all act, acting totally independently uh, in, in issues of commerce. And that's the foundation of our country is that the United States of America, that you have to, the states only have jurisdiction in their states and not outside of their states. Hold on, Joe. So what you're saying is the state of Idaho could actually be on the winning side of a constitutional law case with this if it goes forward? It, 
Yeah, if it went that far, there's strong belief in the Idaho State House that Idaho would win this lawsuit. Okay, so I want to ask you this, though, because we got a, a viewer who texted in this question to us earlier today. And with all this talk of Idaho pushing back on the Washington taxing the fuel coming into our state, just how much gas do we get as Idahoans from Washington State? Joe, you might know the answer to this. And Brian, it can be tough to quantify and answer that question. So long story short, a lot of the gas from Washington does end up on the panhandle, but it is impossible to say, well, where does each drop of fuel end up in the state of Idaho? Because it is transported and moved around. The point here, though, is regardless of the actual percentage of oil and fuel coming from, uh, I should say gas, not oil, coming from Washington into Idaho, the, the question here is this is more about the principle. Because let's say, for example, Idaho says, OK, we're not going to get our fuel from Washington. We'll go get it from Utah and Montana. What's stopping Utah and, Mo Utah and Montana from saying, well, we're going to do a 6% uh, sales tax as well on, on the fuel going to Idaho? So th the problem here is not necessarily the X's and O's and the ones and zeros on the payroll, but more about the principle of where this could go. And long story short, Brian, you could see a response from Idaho hypothetically saying, well, then we'll charge you something more. So tit for tat, that's not a great way to do business. Idaho lawmakers and Idaho leaders are hoping Washington just doesn't pass this and we don't have to cross a legal bridge. And 6% is not a small number when it comes to taxing as much fuel as we send back and forth. It's right. a lot, yeah. Thank you very much, Joe. Well, meanwhile, back in our own state house, several lawmakers getting a bit antsy about getting their bills heard. In the early moments, moments of House business this morning, three Republicans tried to sidestep procedure and figuratively walk their bills onto the floor for debate. It's something Representative Ron Nade has tried a couple of times already this session, to no avail. He gave it another go this morning for the fourth time, and so did Representatives Tammy Nichols and Heather Scott. Representative Nate of Rexburg tried to bring up his grocery tax bill, tax repeal bill again. Representative Nichols of Middleton tried to bring up her gas tax repeal bill, and Representative Scott uh, Blanchard tried to bring up her abortion ban bill. In the span of 15 minutes, well, all three were defeated, and, and by a lot. The normal process for a bill is, is introduced in committee. They decide to either set it aside or proceed with it. Then there's public testimony. The committee votes on it, and then if passed, it gets sent along to the appropriate chamber. However, House Rule 17 says if a bill has been in a committee for more than five days and has yet to get a hearing, lawmakers can try to call it up to the full House to get a vote. In these three cases, they were personal bills brought up in the House Ways and Means Committee in the middle of last month. So it's been more than five days. However, that committee has yet to even meet. And historically, they don't usually get together until near the end of the session. For example, last year, they didn't even meet for the first time until March 8th. But late word today, the House Ways and Means Committee will meet tomorrow for the first time. And on the agenda, fish and game code revision. So it looks like these three bills and nearly two dozen others are going to have to wait just a bit longer. For the last 11 years, Idaho's political parties have been able to decide if they want their primary elections open or closed. Beginning in 2012, the Republicans chose closed. The Democrats chose to leave theirs open. The law was changed back in 2011 because of a lawsuit. A lawsuit brought forth for the same reasons that we're hearing talk of primary election registration this year. To limit the ability for voters outside the party or those unaffiliated to just jump into and vote in a Republican primary. Can a registered Democrat change their affiliation in order to vote in the GOP, GOP primary? Yes, yes, they can. But they have to do it by a certain date. And this year, that date is March 11th, the same deadline for candidates to officially file to run for office. Unaffiliated voters, however, they can register as a Republican on Election Day and still cast a vote in that Republican primary. Some Republican lawmakers see this as special treatment. They want to stop that from being able to happen. Republican Doug Okonowitz of Hayden introduced House Bill 439 to basically address that. And today, the bill passed the House on a narrow 36 to 32 vote with two lawmakers abstaining. Now, Andrew Bartline has been following the strong debate on the House floor for today. Now, what are the concerns that we're seeing with this bill, Andrew? Well, lawmakers opposing the bill say that it's restrictive. A lot of them, for different reasons, it boils down to the same main point, that an unaffiliated voter doesn't yet know how they want to vote. They don't yet know who they want to vote for, sure. hence the term unaffiliated. Now, Republican lawmakers opposing the bill say unaffiliated voters should be allowed to wait and see who is running, vet those candidates, and if they ultimately choose to support a Republican candidate, they should be able to start offering that support in the primary election. Enforcing unaffiliated voters to sign on to a party the same day candidates must register isn't enough time for them to do that. So here's what a couple Republicans opposing the bill had to say during earlier today. Successful political party tries to build the biggest coalition they can. And when the law is written such that people by default are listed as unaffiliated, kicking them out with a 
two judges to vote on when they expect it to make a uh, significant impact on their their primary, which in my county, the primary is the only opportunity to weigh in on most countywide races ever. I, I, I just can't vote yes for this, Mr. Speaker. I think it would be something that would be a little bit disenchanting for a new voter for them to show up on primary election day having fully understood and not realizing that there was a rule that made them declare their party a few months ago. We heard Democratic Representative Steve Birch further add from his experience door knocking that a lot of people in his district, that would be Boise, consider themselves Republicans, but they won't register with a Republican Party because that affiliation is public knowledge and people, for whatever reason, may want to keep their political leanings and beliefs private. Now, on the other end, lawmakers supporting this bill say the Republican Party should be the ones alone to decide the Republican nominee. And unaffiliated voters should not get special treatment to affiliate and influence the party's vote. Here's Representative Ron Nate from Rexburg supporting the bill. The, the candidate deadline, I think this clears up a lot of that uncertainty so that we make sure that Republicans are voting in the Republican primary, Democrats voting in the Democrat primary, and whatever other party primaries may happen to be in Idaho, those, uh, we have members of those party choosing their nominees. Now, as you said earlier, Brian, this bill did pass in the House. It was a narrow vote. It was decided by four votes, so now it's going to be brought to a Senate committee. So what this looks like, too, we've just seen with last week with Ammon Bundy, he's no longer going to be in the Republican primary. He's going to go independent. So that means if you're unaffiliated, that's your only choice? Is that what we're to understand, then, if that were to be the case coming up this primary? Well, I guess I got a question for you. They could vote in the Democratic primary, I believe, if you're unaffiliated. True. They would not have the opportunity to support a Republican in the Republican primary. But if this bill passes... You would always have to, everybody would have to register by this date, not just the Republicans. So yes. it would kind of close it, the loop for everybody. Yep. All right. Thanks, Andrew. Well, another bill that could affect how you vote this year or how you may help others vote this year is also making moves. Representative Mike Moyle, who last session notably said voting shouldn't be easy, is making a second attempt at a ballot harvesting bill this session. Moyle's bill to stop ballot harvesting from happening in Idaho is heading to the Senate. Ballot harvesting, by the way, refers to third parties collecting and delivering absentee ballots to either the mailbox or the drop box or the clerk's office. And while there hasn't been any voter fraud cases connected to ballot harvesting in Idaho, Moyle's bill would make it a misdemeanor to carry more than six of those ballots at once. And if you're carrying them, they must come from the same household. That could mean family members or roommates. By the way, Moyle also adjusted his phrasing from last session, saying voting should be easy, but cheating should be hard. That bill passed 53-15. And should it pass the Senate and be signed by the governor, it would go into effect immediately. The leader of the free world or the leader of a corporation. One local president is sharing his company's collection of all things presidential. If you got the day off for the holiday today, well, good for you. Now it's time to get down and do some work. And by work, we mean grab your phone and send us a text message. 208-321-5614. As always, don't forget to include your name and the hashtag, the 208. Oh, and stick around because we'll be sharing some at the end of the show and one of them could be yours.
So many questions about President's Day. Is it just one president or two presidents or all of them? And is this really the best day to get the best deal on a mattress? It started out as a celebration of President George Washington's birthday, becoming the fifth federal holiday created by Congress. And we've been honoring it since 1880. But it didn't become a three-day weekend until 1971, thanks to the passage of the Uniform Monday Holiday Act in 1968. And then, like everything else, it became a marketing ploy for advertisers who dubbed it President's Day. It's still known as Washington's birthday, by the way, in that 1968 law. There was a time when they tried to create a separate holiday for President Abraham Lincoln, who was also born in February, or even combine it with Washington's, but both attempts failed. So here we are. If you're looking, though, for a way to honor and celebrate all the presidents, you know, you could just drop by the Pioneer Title Building in Boise. They talk about the assassination and the suspect seized. Big buttons. Yeah, that's a big button. That's kind of cool, that uh, little hatchet. There's a room inside Boise's Pioneer Title Building. They have Life magazine and uh, all the buttons of, uh, of Kennedy. That's a pretty special place. We have other theme rooms, but none quite like this, none on this scale. It sets itself apart because it's the president's room. My name is Tim Bungard. I'm president and CEO of Pioneer Title Company. President, appropriately, in the president's room. We have all the presidents here. And it's not just the presidents on the wall, but we have some memorabilia. They have stamps with his, his, uh, you know, his face on them. This was an idea that was created 28 years ago when we built the building by Dave Ewey. Dave believed in two things. He, he loved theme rooms, and he also was very big on America. Actually, a pretty big section on, on Nixon. Back when, when Dave was collecting, these items, it, it came from the community. It was just things that people had. Flying Elephant Club. They came with their boxes and we spread it all out and we've had it ever since. And uh, How many pieces do you have in here? Yeah, we're guessing four or five hundred. And, and there's some that are just tiny and then there's big plates like that. Newspapers to playing cards to political cartoons. Their collection kind of combs over the election years from 09 through the 90s. It kind of takes you through how society has changed over all these years. Feeling nostalgic for nicotine? They've got that too. It's the pack of uh, cigarettes. Bipartisan packs, of course. And one little bit on the end. Remember this? What else? There you go. So do they. Do you ever come in here just to look around? I do. And when he does, Tim tends to gravitate toward the Kennedy section. This section right in here, uh, the, the little board game that says the Kennedys and they have their faces up on Mount Rushmore. I think what really defined it and, and changed the presidency was probably Kennedy. I think that's when they really became in the public's eye. But I'll come in here by myself and shut the door and I just, I, I kind of savor the moment of what it's truly all about. It was never meant to be political. It was always about the position and the man or woman that had enough guts to sit in that chair because it takes a lot of courage to do that. He is a direct reflection on who we are and that's how important that position is. It's our history, no one else's. We're a republic and these are our presidents and, uh, and that's who's made us who we are and we made them who they are. I love this room. It's a pretty cool room. And yeah, you could stop by to check out the Pioneer Title President's Room as long as they don't have any clients in there signing papers. They also have other theme rooms, a captain's room to celebrate all things piratey and seafaring. There's also a Disney-themed kids' room with pictures and cartoony displays. Tim, the president and CEO, told us the president's room hasn't really changed much over the decades other than a fresh coat of presidential blue paint. And do they plan to add to it? We wanted to know that too. Tim says, likely not since most things are digital these days and people just don't hang on to the stuff like they used to.
You're likely familiar with the official mascot of the Idaho Potato Commission, Spuddy Buddy. You know, the round russet with a red and white shirt and where's Chuck Taylor's on his feet? And if you've been with this show for more than a minute, then you probably already know, we're not really afraid to show Spuddy Buddy on occasion. Usually, and when we see this, when we saw this picture of Spuddy Buddy, we kind of, well, we did get a little bit scared, I have to admit. Christina Carbonaro posted this picture on Reddit over the weekend. She says she was at the Walmart on 12th and Greenhurst in Nampa on Saturday and saw this. Yeah, it's certainly Spuddy Buddy, I guess, maybe. Is that pillows stuffed in a sack? I don't even, I can't, I don't, uh, vacuum hoses for arms? I mean, I get the effort, we applaud the effort with a golf clap, I guess. Yeah, those are blocks for feet, some sort. Christina says, it scared her two-year-old twice, as it should. And now, likely we're gonna have nightmares for the rest of the week. All right, before we get to the end of the show, I want to remind you, you can find the 208 at any of these spots that you see on the screen right there. Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, and through email. Just look for the 208 KTVB or at the 208 KTVB. We're also on YouTube. All shows, entire shows, we post there shortly after that day, or after the show that day. You can find the entire show online on our YouTube channel, so check us out there. Anytime, if you miss the show, you can catch it anytime on YouTube. All right, for those of you who did catch the show today and sent in some text messages, here's one that uh, we might be able to answer for you. How does someone change their party affiliation? Well, depends on where you live. Some you have to go down to the clerk's office in person or you can do online. Ada County, for example, you can begin uh, registering for the primary election on March 8th. That deadline, though, right now, if you're going to go Republican, is March 11th. And depending on what the legislature does, that could be the same for everyone. Stay tuned. 
Every Idaho taxpayer pays for every election held in Idaho. Any independent voter should, should be able to vote for any candidate on the day of any election, period, says Steve. No more blocking things out to where you can only vote in certain party primaries. I don't want to have to be affiliated with a party. I want to vote for the best candidate. We got a lot of these today, too, uh, sent along saying, why should we be limited in the early stages of an election when we still just want to vote for the best candidate, regardless of the party? Having to register for any party is a hole that should be closed. We as voters should be able to vote for any party. If for nothing else, we can vote for the lesser of two evils, says Larry. Wouldn't the ballot harvesting bill disenfranchise voters who rely on caregivers to mail their ballots? Who would enforce the law and how, asks Sheila. And that's the question many people had at the State House. We do as well. So, for example, I guess the limit is six. If you get fewer than that, you're not, uh, you're not committing a misdemeanor if this law passes. And as far as enforcement, I'm not sure how that plays out either. I don't know that that was in the bill. That's a good question. I'm okay with Washington's gas tax as long as they don't legislate a pot tax, too. That would be a big tax on many Idahoans, says David from Boise, who's familiar with what's going on in Ontario. We'll see you tomorrow.